So now we will uh, start the uh, multidisciplinary tumor board sessions and uh, I would like to invite uh, my colleagues uh, Nivedita Chakrabati on the dais, uh, Dr. Kunal Gala who is an interventional radiologist uh, in my department, uh, Devyani Niyogi, uh, thoracic surgeon, probably uh, joining uh, virtually, uh, Dr. Naveen Mumadi, radiation oncologist, uh, uh, Tata Memorial Hospital probably joined virtually and Dr. Rajiv Kursil, uh, pathologist and uh, my colleague Vijay, uh, please on the rise. So, uh, I will start the first sessions because I have invited so many people, probably most of these cases or scenarios will involve multidisciplinary involvement. So, I just uh, like to highlight uh, regarding this patient, uh, he is 35 year old uh, farmer from Bihar and he is not having uh, any immunocompromised status, neither any typical history that the residents take like the history of hypertension and diabetes mellitus, but still he is having uh, intermittent low grade fever since last 4 months and uh, the headaches which are of recent onset since last 1 month. So, these are the uh, imaging findings. So, uh, I would like to take uh, any of the radiologist who want to take up this case and describe what he feels on these imaging findings. We have x-ray, we have mediastinal window imaging and we have uh, the chest window imaging as well. So, on the radiograph I see there is a left upper lobe mass like consolidation. Uh, which is confirmed on CT. There are areas of non-enhancing uh, either I mean, necrosis or we just can't say it's a mucus filled bronchi or a necrosis. Um, so although it's a 35 year old, so um, it will be difficult to say like you know a malignancy on this case, but still we would need a biopsy. Uh, so uh, I think if Devine is online or Vijay is there uh, from their clinic, if they see in their uh, in OPDs, uh, patients like this, whether they will uh, give a course of antibiotics or uh, they would like to investigate uh, further with a biopsy or they want to do a PET scan first or they want to do a bronchial lavage with the help of the pathologist. So, what will be their practice? I think Asha is there actually. Asha, if you see this particular case, uh, what will be your uh, uh, point in among these investigations? What you will do next? Yeah, yeah. You can see it there. Yeah, looking at this uh, picture, very really less likely it looks infective, you know, because we usually go by the patient history and other things. There is definitely uh, more importantly, this is quite rounded region which we can see, and definitely at this junction only I would plan a biopsy, you know, rather than giving a course of antibiotics, I would like to evaluate a patient up front. Okay. So, uh, we, uh, don't you want to do a PET scan, you want to look for any other sites where there could be anything. So, biopsy has been done what Asha has planned and this was the uh, biopsy. So, uh, Rajiv, from this biopsy can we interpret whether uh, we are uh, going towards a uh, malignancy or we are going towards uh, infective etiology? Or whether there is any issues in uh, particular because the lesion seems to be well targeted. Rajiv is online. Okay, uh, Ashi, so uh, now th uh, this is the report is in your hands. So what you will do next? Yeah. So as you have already uh, suggested, no, because uh, sometimes what is the most important is history. Uh, yeah, there is always their patient profile and what we are looking at. At this juncture, I would like to get, you know, whether there are any other sites are there or not. Sometimes even I, I mean, I will, I will tell you about my clinical practice. Uh, if this is not there, I usually get even a screening UHG abdomen done, you know, you look at whether any meds are there or not. Means, I am mean, not saying UHG is very sensitive, but at least you look at whether any liver lesions are there, you know, adrenal gland lesions are there. If anything is found, then we are more likely in the favor of maybe malignancies in this particular situation. Sometimes what we happen, if... Uh, in these cases now the thing is that you might give a course of antibodies look at it but it still whatever we are looking at is not really appearing like a infective or you know inflammatory picture maybe. 
as of now. So in that case, I might, if I couldn't find any other site of biopsy, then again I will tell the patient to get a re-biopsy. So Devyani is there online? Yes, I am there. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah Devyani, you are audible. So I just wanted to know, uh, in this particular patient, uh, now Asha has given, he, he wants to investigate further with the next level of imaging. So whether you want to repeat a biopsy at this point of time or you want to do a PET scan, uh, I will also ask Vijay also the same questions. So now this is the report. So, uh, you know, I agree with uh, what Dr. Asha had said that uh, the lesion looks really quite suspicious and you wouldn't want to miss a malignancy in a 35 year old. And uh, though the biopsy looks quite well targeted, maybe a PET scan can help in two ways. One, it will tell us if there are any metastases or nodes which will go in the direction of malignancy. And second, it will probably give us a hotspot to probably guide our biopsy a little bit better so that uh, when we do a repeat biopsy, we probably go into a more representative area. So PET scan and repeat biopsy for me. So uh, there is a, uh, what are the things you will take care of while you are uh, targeting the nodules which are such big size? So predominantly you need to target the, uh, the solid enhancing areas uh, and not the necrotic area which is there. So PET scan will particularly help in uh, the high SUV uh, uptake whichever uh, the part is there. So this seems like a central mass uh, so you can target the central hilar lesion. So anything wrong in the approach in which the biopsy has been taken? No, it's properly taken but uh, it has to be more central uh, so that if any cheesy material is there it can come out or if there is a solid mass uh, uh, and not the collapse part of the lung. So uh, the PET scan has been done. Uh, so uh, question to Vijay, so now the patient has come to you again after you have, after you have ordered the PET. So there is some area which is showing an uh, high SUV uptake and uh, Nivedita might take up whether it looks to be still uh, infective or neoplastic uh, or whether there is any heterogeneity in the lesion that was there and that could be the factor that could uh, we will get a negative biopsies in the previous sample. Uh, yes, so uh, there is only a, a rim of uptake which you can see. Central is necrosis, the rest of the part peripherally is collapsed lung basically. So. Um, we have to target the uh, avid area. So, uh, but anything you want to suggest, Vijay, in this particular case? No, I would have done the same thing which uh, Devani said. Go pet city and into this. I would have targeted that area. So basically, again, uh, from the pet directed area, so uh, we just targeted, and there was an organizing pneumonia, but the cause of organizing pneumonia was the cryptococcal infection. So the, though the patient was not having any immunodeficiency uh, when we have done and the uh, patient because he is having uh, headaches, we have done the CSF sampling also and in the CSF sample also it shows cryptococcus. So this was very atypical presentation of low grade fungal infections properly because he was a farmer, he was exposed uh, to this kind of hue uh, and dust and uh, he has get organizing pneumonia because of that. So we don't know. So PET is... Uh, um, essential when we get multiple negative biopsies uh, to target an area which is uh, avid and it will require a multidisciplinary approach from which area we have to target, whether we have to target or not and uh, uh, require a lot of clinical correlation as well because the patient is having persistent fever, uh, there was a high index of uh, in suspicion of in, uh, infection as well but the morphology was something which is very atypical uh, of a routine infection. So this is followed by three months, uh, though the lesion has not regressed because uh, it was an atypical infection like fungal or they will take time to resolve, but there is a significant improvement in the symptoms that was seen uh, at this point of time. So there could be a lot of uh, mimics which can be, uh, mimic like uh, lung cancer, it could be aspergillosis, tuberculosis, mycormycosis, PMF, IMFT, they all look like uh, intraculinary masses uh, probably look like malignancy because of their size and speculations but uh, they will turn out to be uh, benign conditions. So uh, that is the case that we need histopathology in each and every case before we contemplate any kind of treatment. So going to uh, lung cancer uh, which is an early, lung uh, early stage lung cancer. So 73 year old male, uh, never smoker, hypertensive, diabetic, there is a past history of pulmonary tuberculosis and uh, he is having cough since 4 months 
and the upper tolerance was one flight. He was walking with a stick following the left femur surgery and these are the uh, findings. So, uh, so what, uh, you will see that this is the lung finding. I will try to show some medicinal window as well. So, if you see this kind of uh, case with a uh, report which is saying probably could be tuberculosis, probably could be neoplastic and uh, further clinical and uh, pathological correlation is needed. So, what you will do? Uh, so, what I can see on this scan is first of all a lot of emphysematous is fibrotic changes in both the lung fields but there is a speculated lesion in the right upper lobe which looks quite solid and quite suspicious along with a thin rim of effusion and uh, he's a smoker right I think you said he's a smoker yeah, yeah so in this backdrop I think uh, I would go ahead with a biopsy of the right upper so uh, to Vijay, the findings looks to be uh, involving almost all the areas of the right side of the lung. We don't know there is, there might be some findings which are on the left side also. So uh, do you need biopsies in this particular scenarios uh, because there is a almost widespread involvement of the lung and the patient's ECOG status is not uh, very good. So if the patient's ECOG status is not good, according to me, the patient should be sent home. But uh, if you are contemplating treatment, you need a biopsy. Okay. So, uh, that is the message that uh, if you want to give any treatment, you should have uh, some histological proof to give that kind of treatment. So, Nevidita, uh, mm -hmm. do you agree with the findings that uh, Devianian uh, has enumerated or you have a different set of opinion? No, I could definitely see a, a speculated lesion in the right upper lobe. The rest of the findings could be like fibrosis and all in the mediastinal window. They are not showing much of uptake. And of course, there's a rim of effusion and a lot of emphysema. So yes, I do agree with the findings mentioned. Uh, so Vijay, uh, the uh, lesion, uh, the scan is also showing some uh, pleural effusion. So what if it has to be tested along with the biopsy uh, that we are contemplating in the right upper lobe. So there is a effusion also in this particular fish. So if, if there is an effusion and if I can get, see today in lung cancer not only I would like to have a diagnosis, I would like to have the type of histology and would like to have molecular information also. So given a choice, my choice would be for biopsy. But if there is a good effusion and I can get a good cell block out of it and my pathologist can give me that same information with that, I am okay with that also. So Rajiv, Rajiv is there? Yes, Namit. Yes, Amit. Yeah, Rajiv. Uh, so, you want sample from effusion or you want sample from uh, the right upper lobe nodule? So, uh, we are happy with any sample which uh, which give, give us a good uh, diagnostic yield. So, uh, because pure uh, uh, fluid sam cytology uh, these samples after initial evaluation are also routinely converted into cell blocks, which is as good as the as the biopsy sample uh, sp specimen. So, any uh, representative sample either from the primary region or uh, from the metastatic site is, is good enough uh, for us. So, the CT guided biopsy was done and uh, it was uh, reported as adenocarcinoma, it was TDF and positive. Uh, USG guided pleural type uh, fluid was done which was negative for uh, malignancy. So, uh, what further uh, workup is required? Namini is there. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Naveen. Uh, Hi. Sorry, I'm asking uh, before surgeons to you. So, this uh, case directly ended in your RTOPD and uh, uh, whether yeah. you, uh, what kind of further investigation you do for metastatic workup? Yeah, thanks, Amin. So, before I just, just go there, uh, in addition to what, what the previous panelist just mentioned, uh, I would also want to uh, look at the serial image of this patient because he has had multiple admissions uh, in the past when he had uh, tuberculosis of the bone. So, uh, it is worthwhile looking at his uh, previous x-rays if he has uh, even even before we attempt any kind of biopsy because that would also kind of give us an inkling about the uh, natural history of the disease. Uh, this effusion was always there before and uh, that would kind of make me uh, decide whether I would want to put a needle into the effusion or not. But otherwise, I agree we should definitely have a part in the biopsy. And uh, now that we have the biopsy which shows uh, lung cancer, uh, metastatic workup 
uh, in all patients whom we treat radically, we would always ask for a complete metastatic uh, workup, which includes a PET CT scan of the whole body. And for the uh, brain, we would get an uh, MR image. The only exceptions, uh, my surgical colleagues also uh, is the patients with uh, T1 lesions, which are uh, kind of uh, peripherally located. But in this patient was what mix of uh, chronic infective changes and a suspicious lesion in the lung, I think it is worthwhile getting a, a MRI a PET CT scan. So what would be a choice? It is a PET CT scan, uh, CCT with a uh, MRI brain. So, uh, this was the only lesion, there was no hyaluronidistin uptake, there was no pleural effusion of distinct metastasis and there was no brain metastasis. Devani, uh, how would you like to uh, take this case, whether you want to go ahead with the surgery or uh, you want to discuss any multidisciplinary meet for uh, other uh, possibilities given that the lung might be bad? Yeah, so you know, considering that uh, he is uh, poor ECOG status and general condition like we discussed using a walking stick etc, I don't think he's a very ideal surgical candidate and also the lung fields didn't look very encouraging for any kind of a lung resection. So I would definitely like to discuss this in an MDP and uh, get the radiation oncologist's opinion whether they can do something for this patient because surgery seems unlikely. So you don't want to take the uh, opinion of Kunal because he also looking excited, uh, looking at the patient is less than 3 cm in size. There are no nodes and there are no metastases. Uh, so I think we will invite Kunal also to the MDT and let Kunal and Naveen take it from there and go fist to fist with this one. Okay. So the thing is that uh, Kunal, uh, uh, probably this uh, has discussed with uh, you and uh, both Naveen. Whether you want to stage uh, this particular patient uh, with any further workup like EBUS or midastinoscopy, what kind of whether you want to do EBUS first or midastinoscopy or you directly want to ask for a midastinoscopy because now uh, Devian is not doing the surgery but she might be interested in doing midastinoscopy. Uh, EBUS would be better because it is done under uh, conscious sedation. Uh, so the risk is pretty much less compared to midastinoscopy. So, uh, if uh, EBUS does not have upstaged, then uh, uh, then uh, mediastinoscopy could be avoided. And as such, surgery is out of question. So, either SBRT or ablative techniques uh, would be for the line of management. Okay. So, any uh, different opinion, Devyani, uh, regarding the mediastinal uh, staging workup or Naveen? Um, actually, if uh, there weren't any suspicious looking nodes on the scan and uh, the plural cytology was negative and the lesion is P1 peripheral, maybe this is a case in point for avoiding any of these immediate sign of staging. What would you say, Naveen? Would you agree? Yeah, so this is what we generally do in our clinic also. It's uh, as just uh, Devani said, so if it's a P1 peripheral lesion uh, and if there are no suspicious looking node on the uh, CT image, then probably. Uh, we would let EBUS go, especially if this patient is not being touched for a surgical management. Because most of our patients who are managed non-surgically with SBRT or uh, don't get their medicinal state unless there is a lymph node which is uh, suspicious. So I think we have discussed these issues, um, comorbidities, limited functions and the other issues which has to be handled like borderline pulmonary functions and the patient which is having high, uh, hypertension, moderate pulmonary hypertension. So, uh, I think uh, Kunal is not going to join clinics too much, so that's why the patient has been planned for SBRT. And uh, Naveen, uh, I just want to ask uh, what are the uh, complications that can occur in this uh, particular site when you are delivering SBRT? Yeah, so uh, for the uh, information of the general audience, SBRT is basically stereotactic body radiation wherein we give a very high dose of radiation to a precise target. In this patient, he has a peripherally located lesion where uh, uh, we give around 12, 12 to 15 gray per sitting and that's repeated five times. Uh, so the entire treatment is over in a peak, week and a half. So, uh, so where, because we are able to deliver such a high dose, we expect a uh, tumor kill to happen uh, and uh, has many uh, prospective studies have shown that uh, the local control and the survival are uh, as good as probably uh, surgery. 
the only complications with stereotactic uh, body radiation is because the hide is being delivered. Depending on the location where the lesion is, patients can either have uh, uh, certain pulmonary complications, especially if it's a peripheral located lesion, uh, because some uh, amount of uh, radiation would fall on the ribs. Patients can have micro fractures in the ribs, which can manifest to pain uh, uh, later on. Uh, apart from that, since the target is very small, radiation pneumonitis is very, very uh, less uh, encountered in the clinic. If it is a centrally located lesion because of the proximity to the critical structure, the heart, the plate vessels, there is, a, a, and also the proximal bronchial tree, there is always a risk of pulmonary hemorrhage, especially with very high doses. So that's the reason why in a centrally located lesion, we kind of temper our doses and give slightly less dose per fraction. That would mean that the treatment is slightly like longer. So this particular uh, patient is also having a reduced description of interstitial lung disease. So uh, that will uh, affect your uh, thinking that... Yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, although I mentioned that the uh, pulmonary complications are less with uh, SBRT, uh, the presence of IRD is one uh, uh, situation where we are little careful and we select patients uh, and also the dose that we get. Because the presence of IRD as such can increase the risk of radiation pneumonitis even with the uh, precise treatment. So, Unless I have a very small lesion uh, situated in the upper lobe, uh, I would be really uh, worried in a patient by idea. I would want to look at the PFTs and get a chest lesion. So, uh, so uh, Kunal, I just have one question. So, this is the location which is periphery, and uh, so uh, are there any specific challenges to do RF operation in this particular scenario, knowing that there is a history of interstitial lung disease and there is an earlier history of tuberculosis? No, uh, there are no particular challenges because it's peripherally located, uh, so uh, you can cover with good margins at least 0.5 uh, centimeters uh, uh, surrounding the lesion. So there is no much of the issue except for uh, some amount of pneumothorax which can happen because of ILD which can be easily managed with a small drainage uh, tube post procedure if uh, pneumothorax happens. So uh, do you think uh uh, the cryo would be a safer option here or it, you, do you think that there is a RF population which will be more feasible in this particular so, setting? So there are many uh, ablative modalities like uh, uh, RF ablation, microwave and a cryo which is just coming to TMH. So uh, the advantage of cryo is you can see the ice ball formation uh, uh, on, on the CT scan. So that's the biggest advantage. With RF and microwave you actually are not able to see the zone of ablation. So that's the greatest advantage of cryo ablation. But this, uh, the disadvantage of cryo is the size of the needle is too uh, large so that's the flip point so uh, but uh, you you can get away with that uh, and you can see good amount of zone of ablation thank you so now there is a new variant so i have not mentioned the variant so there is a covid in case of early lung cancer so a 69 year male patient uh, never smoker it was treated for normal metastatic sigmoid colon cancer in, in December 2018. Uh, on follow-up scan in July 2020, there was a right upper lobe lung lesions. A PET was done which showing 2.8 cm uh, size lesion in the right upper lobe. There is no significant mediastinal lymphadenopathy on CT. There was no distant metastasis in the area which covered the CT scan. And the CA levels and colonoscopy is normal. Uh, so uh, Vijay, uh, if that patient is following with you, so, uh, how would you like to assess further in this particular setting? I will move for a biopsy. A patient of, who, was, who was on follow-up has developed a lung uh, nodule and is a case of sigmoid. And uh, so, and, uh, getting a sigmoid without having something in the liver is a bit rare. So, but I would go for the biopsy. Uh, the CEA level, if initially they were, they were elevated, then it helps. If the CA levels initially were normal, then it doesn't help on follow up basically. So Nivedita, there is a question to you. So you will see that uh, on the there is a CT and there is a PET CT. So do you think it could be infection or do you think it is going to be metastasis or it is something else apart from metastasis? So I would rule out the possibility of a primary lung malignancy over here because it's like a solid with surrounding ground glass, a so solitary module I presume. So, uh, I would definitely want to go ahead and do a biopsy and think about that possibility, especially CE and all the and a solitary lesion. Uh, okay. 
so rajiv there is a question to you so can you differentiate between a, a primary lung uh, adeno versus a adeno that is arising uh, secondary to sigmoid uh, metastasis yes so uh, on tissue, um, basic histo histology it is it will be dis some uh, difficult to distinguish between the two if it is a uh, adenocarcinoma of the rectum versus adenocarcinoma of lung but we do need a uh, uh, support of immunohistochemistry to prove them and there are uh, distinct markers which are available uh, like adenocarcinoma of lung will express ttf1 uh, or napsin uh, whereas the adenocarcinoma of primary of colon uh, they they will Express CDX2 or SACB2 is the another new marker which is uh, uh, which is usually positive in the adenocarcinoma of, of colon and not of not in the lung. Primary. So if it is a uh, carcinoma of uh, anal canal and you will find a uh, squamous cell CA on uh, lung, then uh, would that change the situation for you from the good position in the adeno to bad position in squamous? Yeah, so on adenocarcinoma, uh, it is easy because uh, we do have a, a support of, we can use ISC markers. But uh, for squamous carcinomas, uh, it is uh, so it's more difficult uh, because based on morphology or even the routine ISCs, it is difficult. Sometimes we do try uh, doing a, a P16, uh, if because the common tumors which can come to the lung is, they are, can be either from the genital tract or uh, uh, oropharynx. So they do express P16 and primary squamous carcinoma of lung are, are, are usually they are negative, uh, but rarely they can be positive. Otherwise, we have to go back to radiologist and uh, take their opinion to distinguish them. Okay. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Devani, the question is to you uh, whether again uh, whether you want to. This is also a peripheral uh, lesion. You want to do an invasive medicinal sampling. You know that now there is a COVID and uh, this patient was uh, RT-PCR positive. So what is now the hospital policy for uh, invasive testing in COVID? Uh, so I take this question in two parts. So whether I want to do an invasive media standard staging for this patient, uh, I would say no. Uh, having said that, I would like to make it clear for everybody in the audience that invasive media standard staging is a very, very important component of lung cancer staging. And like we discussed in the previous state, uh, case, even in this case, we may avoid it because it is less than 3 centimeters, it is peripheral and there are absolutely no suspicious looking nodes on the PET scan. If none of these criteria were matched, we would have gone in. But in this case, since all three criteria are present, we can avoid an invasive meter sinus staging. And as far as the fact of him being RT-PCR positive, uh, unfortunately, we will just have to isolate him and repeat a test after 14 days and see how that goes. So uh, again, there is uh, whether we can consider non-surgical options also in this particular case where you want to go ahead with the surgery. If uh, that so would become negative, if that or if. so, as long as he is COVID positive, I don't think any treatment options exist. So I think we'll uh, and if he becomes COVID negative and the lung function is still good, I think he is very much a surgical candidate. So this patient underwent uh, unipotal wax uh, right upper lobe uh, lobectomy with the. Uh, additional lymph node dissection. Uh, so this patient uh, after post-operative course, uh, post-operative day 40 presented to the OPD with the shortness of the breath and there is a persistent dry cough and uh, the SQO2 on the room here was 90% which has improved to 98% of 4 liters of oxygen and there was a patch that was there in the left lower jaw. So you can see that uh, there is a patchy density in the left lower. So Nivedita, are these findings specific for any uh, particular thing? So uh, definitely they can be uh, COVID in such a scenario first thing that comes from mind is uh, COVID. So but uh, also uh, the sequelae of COVID initially uh, on initial CT scan this wasn't there. Yeah so initial CT it was not there but on POD40 we developed these kind of symptoms uh, the and uh, that is the scenario right now. So um, the so first these uh, happened because uh, uh, after the RT-PCR test positivity uh, or whether it was resolving state of COVID or it was an active state of COVID. Can you comment upon these based on the CD images? So uh, uh, it has also been shown in literature that ground glass opacities can also, uh, I mean the sequelae of COVID can also present as ground glass opacities. 
So uh, this could be a manifestation of that since initially the RT-PCR was positive. So uh, Naveen and Devani, uh, so uh, what do you do, do you, uh, to confirm this finding whether you will repeat a COVID RT-PCR or you do a bronchoscopy and culture whether there is some other infection or you use anti-COVID antibodies in this particular scenario? Go ahead. Right, so um, in this I think we'll end up doing all three because it's a very uh, unusual presentation for this to after 40 days of surgery in the contralateral lung. So uh, repeat COVID RT-PCR for sure because that's the first thing you do before doing any other invasive procedure. We would want to take a bronchoscopy and take cultures from the left lower lobe to see if there's any other active infection going on. And I think even the anti-COVID antibodies will help us as to uh, what stage of infection the patient really is in. Thank you, Devi. Yeah. So, uh, I agree with Devi. I mean, one thing is the order probably in which I would do is different. I would do the RT PCR first, and if it's negative, I would do the bronchoscopy and culture. Antibody only if it is negative, uh, only if RT PCR is negative, uh, I would do. Otherwise, if it is positive, then it makes no sense. Right, absolutely. So, Vijay and Ashi, uh, I just want to know you might be seeing a lot of patients which are having COVID. Uh, those who are on uh, palliative chemotherapy. So, whether uh, the COVID uh, in this it is impacting the prognosis of these patients? Yeah, so, uh, so, COVID mainly, uh, uh, actually when we have seen, it is more affected especially patients with the lung cancer and especially when the underlying disease was uncontrolled or more of a lung metastasis were there, you know. So, all these three things were actually essentially affecting uh, the mortality in the cancer patient, otherwise not. See if I am taking a, a control of both the things. So basically, uh, these three things were most essential. Uh, was the con the control of the disease were there or lung metastasis were there or not when the diagnosis of COVID was there? Just giving this to highlight to this particular case, I just wanted to highlight. See the thing is that I think he was COVID positive initially, and uh, I think uh, once its PCR became negative, I think he would have been operated. So the thing is that uh, co COVID antibodies. What it is going to fetch is a different thing altogether. Means I don't know. Ki, I mean, looking at COVID antibodies was he initially had a COVID PCR, so COVID antibodies will not be giving any diagnostic thing. The repeat COVID infection within the span of two to three weeks again becomes a problem. I mean, I mean it's very difficult to stay. So I think if you ask me, the only investigation I will be doing is a bronchoscopy and culture. Why? Because I wanted to get to the specific thing. Because repeat COVID PCR, I mean, patient getting repeated infections within a span of four to six weeks is just pretty unheard of. Covid antibodies will not yield me anything because it was already covid positive so he is bound to have nucleocapsid antibodies. So anyway he was, even if his antibodies are positive that will not assist me in any clinical decisions per se. So the only thing I will be left with is a bronchoscopy get what is a bath routine done and the cultures. I think that is the only thing which will fetch me anything out of this at all. So uh, to you Vijay, uh, when we see that uh, this nodule when it have a recurrence and it is having multiple uh, lesions. You want to do a repeat biopsy in that uh, scenario? So the, the question is, uh, uh, the patient has recurred and there are multiple uh, nodules. Correct. There. So because this patient has only undergone surgery and has not received any other therapy in between, I would actually, uh, and if it's radiologically seems to be, if you are you're confident in telling me it's much, I won't actually go ahead and do it. Do a repeat biopsy. I would, if I need molecular information, I would take it from the initial uh, surgical specimen which was which was there. Now, if there is a suspicion whether this is COVID or whether this is because this patient had multiple episodes of COVID, is it whether it's COVID or whether it's it's it is a recurrence, then in that case, I would consider doing that. Or else, okay. So, if there is an uh, upfront presentation of a uh, uh, lung cancer with a metastatic disease and uh, which is not uh, deemed curable by any intent whether it is an RFA or it is this thing. So uh, what are the kind of uh, testing you would require in those particular patients? So, traditionally the testing which would go is one for diagnosis. You would, I would need a diagnosis of which exact type of the cancer it is and what is the histology. And I would need the molecular information to, with the diagnosis to, to plan my treatment. The other would be for to evaluate what is the disease 
extent and that, that helps in me in response assessment to deciding uh, whether the patient is responding or not not responding. Today in lung cancer, like if it's I'll positive, I'm looking at 5 year survivals, greater than 50% and EGFR it's 5 year survivals of 40%. So I will need that documentation where all where the disease, disease is there. And the next set of investigations are to see whether the patient is fit for the therapy or not. So that would include uh, CBC, or RFT and LFTs to understand whether the patient is fit because most of the drugs which I give would require modifications if uh, any of these organ functions are are dealing. So yeah. this with the way it would be for one. For so just to uh, uh, yeah. for the highlighting of the residents, if we see uh, that there is a lung cancer which is an adenocarcinoma, so uh, do we require uh, mutations uh, in both adeno and squamous? Yes, uh, yes. You require mutations today both in adeno and squamous. Squamous adeno, uh, like in Indian setting, we would have. EGFR mutations in uh, if we test for 100 patients in India, we would get uh, EGFR mutations anywhere between 25 to 30 percent. percent. ALK, ALK mutations, since we have started doing IHC, that rate has 1 to, to 8 to 12 percent. So that means around 30 to 40 percent of patients would have either have EGFR or ALK. When you look for other mutations like ROS mutation, MET mutation, NTRK uh, mutations, HER2 new mutation, this number would then come to around 50 percent. So, and this changes the management. If the patient has any of these mutations and you could give appropriate targeted therapies, we are looking at response rates of around 70% or greater and we are actually talking about 5 year survivals for at least one third to half of these patients. So yes, mutation analysis needs to be done. When we look at squamous, yes, the mutation rates are low but still you could get EGFR mutations and other, other mutations can be get in squamous. Even for that small proportion of patients which you get in squamous, it changes the treatment pattern for this uh, for this patient. So yes, we need to do mutation analysis in squamous cell cancer also. In fact, with the mutation analysis, I would actually ask for the immunotherapy markers like PDL1 to be also be done in this uh, in this patient because if the patient turns out to be mutation negative, my further treatment will be determining what is the expression of this immune-related markers in the cancer. Uh, so uh, thank you Vijay. We are, as we are overshooting time, it's now uh, almost going around 3. We would like to end the panel and uh, thank you so much uh, that you all have uh, come here on the Sunday and uh, participated in a very beautiful manner and those who have done online also have contributed a lot in the academic teaching programs. Uh, thank you Ashe, thank you Vijay and thank you Kunal and uh, Nevedita for this uh, wonderful session. Thank you so much. Thank you sir. Thank you Amit. Sir, thank you Kumar sir. So I would like to end.